Hello, and welcome to this lesson discussing contract discovery and how to define a contract using the TWS API. Please note that our starting file content will mirror the previous video on essential API components. As a result, I would encourage viewers to review the last lesson before going further in this lesson. To explore contract definitions, we can utilize the eClient.rec contract details and eWrapper.contract details as this provides the baseline of contract discovery before moving into other functionality like market data or order placement. Starting out with last lesson's template, without the current time references, we could start by writing out the eWrapper.contractDetails function. All we need to do is define the function contractDetails inside of our test app class. This function takes three arguments, self, recID, and contractDetails. The first two we are familiar with, but contract details is a unique class, contract details, which contains all of the contract's information in a dictionary structure, including things like the underlying contract details, the supported exchanges, and trading hours. Users are welcome to print this value directly. However, since we'll be printing and reading the value, we can utilize some of Python's dictionary handling. With that in mind, I will create a variable ATTRS or attributes and set it equal to the VARS method, taking our contract details as an argument. This will produce the key value pair of our contract details object. Then I'll look to print a string joined lambda set. This will appear as print and then in parentheses and then in quotes backslash n, end quote, followed by dot join. And in a set of parentheses, we're going to include an F string for the name being set to the value object, and then for name, comma value in attrs.items, and then a set of parentheses. This will print out all of the attributes of our variable. I will also add another eWrapper function, contract details end. This function simply indicates when there is no data remaining for a request that may return several responses to a single request. The method only takes self and rec ID as arguments to help with request tracking. I will use this method to announce the end of contract details and also disconnect our API session, similar to how we did with the current time method before. Now we can move on to the request side of things. Let's keep going to start with and focus on requesting stock contract details. Then we can build up futures or options contracts later, since those are a bit more complex. We can create a variable such as my contract and set it equal to a contract object. Now I can start establishing my contract. As a test case, maybe all I know about my trading is that I want to trade Apple stock. Therefore, I can set my contract dot symbol to AAPL, and then my contract dot sec type equal to stock or STK. Please be aware that nearly all sec type values are three or four character representations of a given security type. For example, we might see STK for stocks, OPT for options, or FUT for futures. We can then send out our eClient.RecContract details request to find information on this contract. This request only takes the argument for a request ID, which we'll use our app.nextID function for, and then a contract object, which we'll use my contract for. With these simple additions set, we can run our code and we should see a large amount of data returned. This is because a contract details method can be used to receive any contract that approximately matches our contract object. The best way to distinguish between your contracts is to look at the actual contract value returned. This will return essential values like the con ID, symbol, security type, trading exchange, and listing exchange. Before moving on, let's take a moment to look at the overall response of the contract details object. I can see the extended detail of our contract object, but also values like order types which show the supported order types with the instrument, liquid hours, time zone ID, and even market rule information. But this was not exactly what I intended to receive, so let's further truncate this request. Starting out, I can set my contract's currency value to USD, 
since I only care to trade in my own base currency. Then I can also set my exchange value to smart because I only want to trade using the interactive broker smart routing feature. If we request data now, we'll see that adding two additional parameters returns a single contract for our use and it's just the contract I wanted. These four values, symbol, sec type, exchange, and currency are the basis of any contract we'd like to use. Users should look to include the primary exchange value where possible. This is the item just after our trading exchange in the contract object and can be used to distinguish between multiple companies that have otherwise matching symbols and require more distinction. Adding the primary exchange can re help resolve most ambiguous contracts. With our baseline stock settled, we can move on to futures contracts. Before requesting our contract, I'll adjust my eWrapper.ContractDetails method to just print the ContractDetails.Contract value to help conserve some space when I print, at least while we're exploring. ContractDetails.Contract is identical to the contract object we are creating in our request. As a result, the parameters we can send can be mirrored in the parameters we receive. We can uncomment the lambda function later once we have narrowed down our contract. We can tweak our existing contract to another contract we're looking for. I want to look into ES futures trading, so I'll adjust my contract symbol and security type to ES and FUT accordingly. For those unaware, smart routing is only supported for stocks, options, and combinations. As a result, I would not be able to use smart for my ES futures. So in this case, I will comment out the exchange field and send my request. This will return numerous contracts, though we'll notice that a lot of the contracts coming back are either CME or QB ELGO. Given I don't want to trade the ELGO, and I simply want to trade the CME exchange, I'll uncomment my exchange value and set this to CME. We can also find the date values, which correlate to the last trade date or contract month value. I will add this to my own contract month for December and I can receive only the ES contracts traded by CME in December of 2024. If we uncomment our Lambda function and run our script, we'll find all of the relevant information we need about our ES futures contract. Before diving into the options contract, I'll once again comment out the contract details Lambda function and simply print the contract object. I will also tweak my existing contract object again but now I'm thinking about trading SPX options. This will only require a few modifications from the ES contract and would be an almost identical set of values if we were looking to trade futures options. I will adjust my symbol to SPX, sec type to OPT, and my exchange back to smart. If we run the script, we'll receive hundreds of results back as there are several expiries, writes, and strikes traded throughout the month of December even with our existing filtering. To filter out our options contract further, I'll set my write to put using my contract dot write equals P. In the case of writes, you may use P or put for your puts or C or call for call options. With our write set, there is still a lot to filter. Near the end of our contract object, we'll notice these SPX and SPXW values. These are known as the trading class of the contract and distinguish between multiple matching derivatives. In this scenario, this distinguishes between monthly SPX contracts and the weekly SPX contracts denoted by the W at the end. This is especially relevant as the two contracts can overlap their expiration date and the trading class may be the only distinctive value. If we make the request now, we will still find tons of results. This is because all of the potential strike values are being returned, which is particularly large, especially for an index like SPX. As a result, it's best to further truncate our request by including a strike in our contract. I will narrow my focus to a strike of 5300, which gives us one last contract. I will uncomment our Lambda function before returning the script so we can see all of these values that were being requested and returned. There are several additional security types with their own unique parameters. 
I'd like to briefly discuss some additional resources users should consult to find these details. With regard to the API-specific fields, the TWS API contract class reference is listed in our documentation on IBKR Campus that provides context to each new parameter for review. Similarly, we also maintain the entire contracts page, which users should consult to find which parameters are needed for each contract type. This will provide an API agnostic structure, which displays what values such as symbol, sec type, and exchange are required for special contract types. This will even include information on building futures spreads or options combos, all of which are built on the foundation discussed through this lesson. Finally, users should look to utilize Trader Workstation's description page for more insight on retrieving contract-specific details to accomplish this. Search for any contract you typically consult in your day-to-day -day trading. After adding the contract to your watch list, or if it's already in your portfolio, right-click on the instrument, click the drop-down arrow, then Financial Instrument Details, and finally, Description. This will bring up a window in Trader Workstation, which provides nearly all of the contract information discussed here. It is an essential tool while you are learning to search for contracts through the API independently. This concludes our lesson on defining contracts in the TWS API. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, please be sure to review our documentation or leave a comment below this video. We look forward to having you in the next lesson of our TWS API series.